Okay, let's hear it for the OG, the original gangster, Dr. Johnson. I want you to take your pen and paper out real quick. Um, Dr. Johnson mentioned an ICD-10 code that every diagnosed person should ensure that their physician has on their record. Write this down, G71.02. That is the code that needs to be on your record to ensure that insurance companies can um, accurately count the number of patients that we have out there and actually start to reimburse for genetic testing and reimburse when we have treatments. Please ensure if you are clinically or if you are genetically diagnosed that that code is in your record so that we can do this for you. Okay. Thank you. All right. G71.02. That is the, that's the diagnosis for FSHD. All right. Next up, I would like to introduce a researcher and friend, uh, Dr. Suja Jagannathan from the University of Colorado, who is part of our um, FSHD C CTRN sites. Um, she's going to explain this really important research that she is um, conducting and why her team is here next door collecting blood. So welcome, Dr. Jagannathan. All right. Um, okay, so I want to talk to you today about a study that we are doing and, and why we are doing it, really. So we heard about how there's many companies that are entering the space of FSG therapeutics, which is really exciting, right? And to be able to get these treatments to as many people as possible, they need to go through and get approved by FDA. And what FDA needs for those drugs to be able to do is show that it works, right? And to be able to show a drug works, you need what are called biomarkers. These could be, you know, functional outcomes where you look at someone's muscle strength and how it's improving over time. But as we all know, that takes time. And if someone is non-ambulatory, that may not be something that they can readily show. So my lab's been interested in what we call blood-based biomarkers, which report on disease activity that's happening in your body by looking at your blood. And the one that we are currently exploring is this um, biomarker called cell-free DNA. So let's start with what cell-free DNA is. So when cells in your body die, they empty their contents into the bloodstream because blood, which takes nutrients to all parts of your body, is also the waste management system of your body. So when cells die, they dump their DNA into the blood and that starts circulating. And this is something that we think can be um, leveraged to look at how much FSHD activity is going on in a person's body. And there's actually a long history of using cell-free DNA to diagnose and to track disease. In fact, it's no standard of care when a woman is pregnant with a child to be able to diagnose genetic issues in the child by looking at DNA of the child in mom's blood. Right? People diagnose trisomies this way now. This is what I did three years ago when I had my baby, they just took my blood and told me, your child's okay. People do this for solid tumors all the time. If there's a tumor in your liver, a tumor in the brain, that DNA ends up in your blood and we can look at where is the, the cancer happening, what's the mutation and all of that. So if we can do this for a baby growing in a mom's belly and for a solid tumor in, in the brain, why couldn't we do this for the muscle? Right? And that was the idea we started with, that FSHD is a huge thing happening in a friend individual's body. So we should be able to look at our blood and ask, is there a trace of disease in the blood? And so that's exactly what we did. And uh, we wanted to look for both DUX4 expression, the gene that causes this disease, and also the genetic um, region, the D4Z4, and ask, can we track these patterns in the blood? Um, and the hope is that once we find a pattern that is really robust, maybe we can use it to track response to treatment, right? That is really the goal here. Diagnosis doesn't change over time, but then your body could still respond to treatment that then shows up in the blood and we can track that. Um, so we were lucky in that we were able to get data from a group in uh, University of Washington, Dan Miller and Premi Haynes, who had already collected some of this data that we could use. So they had uh, cell-free DNA from four unaffected and 12 FSHD-affected individuals that Dr. Wong had collected. This data set had some caveats. It's a really small number of uh, you know, samples, and it was also collected in a way that we thought may not be the most ideal, but we thought 
Only way to do this is to find out and try. And it worked. So I'm just going to, before I show you the data, I'm going to tell you what you're looking at. So what we do is we take the cell-free DNA and ask, what is the pattern that we see and what does it match? So for example, we can ask if a DUX4 expressing cell has a certain pattern, how much does the blood DNA match that pattern, okay? So the lower the rank, the better the match. So what you're looking at here is the four control samples versus 12 FSHD samples. And what you see is that there's a better match for DUX4 expressing cells in your blood, just free floating DNA compared to people who are unaffected. And this means that we can actually track this pattern over time and see is somebody now coming back up to the uncontrolled level. Right? And we also did this for the D4Z4 region itself and asked, can we find uh, that pattern also in the blood? And in fact, we do. We have a really statistically significant separation between who's affected and who's unaffected. And this is something that we think we can track over time and use as a biomarker in clinical trials. So what are we go So concluding, we think this is a really promising way to track disease activity in people's bodies. And we can collect a lot of information from the blood to be able to do this. So we are right now collecting samples from a much larger cohort so we can take advantage of the full depth of information available in the samples to be able to find a really robust pattern. And once the signature is established, we're already talking to companies who are gearing up to start their own clinical trials to be able to incorporate this marker into their trials so we can really track how the disease is responding. Okay, um, And then, the next step would also be how cheap can you make this assay? So it's really accessible and any peripheral lab can do this. You don't have to go to a special center to be able to do this, right? Um, and just finishing up here, um, I want to thank the original team, Dan Miller and Premi Haynes, who did this work with Friends of FSH Support. And uh, people in my lab, Cameron and Amy and my collaborators, Srinivas, who uh, were able to you know, really bring this project to fruition. And um, all the patients and families who are generous and give us your time and, and blood to be able to do this. Thank you.